Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to me, your host, Christian Watson. We live in an epistemically dead society. I am almost entirely convinced of that. Now, what do I mean by that? Sounds like a very big word, but in all reality, all that means is we live in a society where our ability to understand things is at a all-time low. Well, actually, our capacity to understand things is at an all-time high, but apparently the willingness of many people to want to understand things that go beyond their own biases is at an all-time low. You could say back in the medieval times, back in the dark ages, or back in the times when space and time were more confined to your surroundings and they weren't able to be transcended by phones, by cameras, by computers, we had less capacity to understand the world, but now we have more capacity to understand the world. And yet, so many people have their understanding dictated by narratives. What do I mean? My friends, it has been grating my gears to see this talk of a great replacement theory blasting around the media, basically coding the political landscape, entering into the political lexicon once again to describe otherwise innocuous political beliefs. If you type in great replacement theory on Google right now, you're going to see several hit pieces against conservatives, against Republicans, basically saying that they believe in a racist theory. If you go deeper, you're going to see that one of the biggest generators of these hit pieces is the Washington Post, who, who, has made, who has published several articles, some news reports, some opinion, attacking particular officials for their opinions on immigration and labeling them as analogous to the Great Replacement theory. Uh, one of these officials, of course, is Ali Stefanik, and the other that is most often attacked is Tar Carlson. Well, first, let me say something right now. If you want to understand someone's stated position, it's probably best that you go to the area where it is. If you go to either Elise Stefanik's Congr official congressional website, and she is the representative from New York, by the way, and you look at her position on immigration, none of it talks about great replacement. None of it even talks about, it simply talks about talks about being against amnesty, it talks about being for border security. If you go to Kevin McCarthy, who is the leader of the House Republican Conference in the House and is one of the most consequential figures within the Republican Party, unfortunately, right now, his website says this, as a nation founded by immigrants, we should continue to embrace the hardworking individuals who come to the United States looking to start a better life and to contribute to our society. However, we are a nation that respects the rule of law. We should not reward those who break our laws with amnesty. We must enforce existing immigration laws while simultaneously securing our borders and addressing our broken visa system. This principle here of securing borders and rejecting amnesty conforms to the statements that Carlson and Stefanik, two of the biggest scapegoats of the media on this thing, have been saying. Stefanik has said, and this has been dubbed Great Replacement Theory, that the Democrats are trying to replace the current electorate with immigrants, but with illegal immigrants rather, by giving them amnesty, and that would be a bad thing. Carlson has effectively said the same thing, and yet, for saying such things, both have been decried as white supremacist or white supremacist adjacent. Indeed, when one actually investigates these statements and mentions that there is a categorical difference between them and the ideas of the Great Replacement Theory, the critics of Carlson and Stefanik will immediately say, well, of course they don't use the actual language. Of course they wouldn't do that. What they do is they use language that is adjacent to um, the Great Replacement Theory. Um, the Albany Times Union, the editorial board of the Albany Times Union, said that uh, uh, Stefanik isn't so brazen as to use the slogans themselves of the Great Replacement Theory. Rather, she couches the hate in alarmist, anti-immigrant rhetoric that's become standard fare for the party of Donald Trump. My friends, this is the argument being progressed by left-leaning speakers and thinkers right now in the media concerning the GOP's broader views on immigration and more specifically, Stefanik and Carlson's broader views. If you type in Elise Stefanik on DuckDuckGo, which is the search engine that I use, although it's going by the wayside, unfortunately, since it's catering to censorious desires, you will see numerous, you will see numerous references to Stefanik, almost all of which are slanderous. And they, Paint this image in your head that Stefanik is this sort of evil 
person who wants to get rid of all people of color or whatever in the country and wants to create a white ethno state. And here's the problem. When I mentioned us being a, 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 a society that is dead to knowledge, what I meant is that headlines in this era drive understanding. And Nicholas Carr writes about this in his brilliant book, The Shallows. He draws this analogy between the digital mind and the literary mind. And the digital mind, according to Carr, is this mind that is primed to enjoy 60 second sound bites, that is a short in its attention span, that is more about efficiency and pleasure than it is about the grueling work of learning something. Whereas the literary mind is a mind belonging to a different age before digitization of information came about a mind that had to grapple with things, had to grapple with concepts. So you can see right here, when you go to the Stefanik page, it says the following, here are the first few articles. Lincoln Project fundraisers off of a Buffalo massacre attacks Stefanik as evil. Harvard lecturer shattered by Elise Stefanik embracing Trump's big lie. National ads attack Stefanik's replacement theory ties. Uh, Anti-Trump group releases new ad charming to Stefanik. Once a moderate Republican business insider, Elise Stefanik is now at the center of the anger over the Buffalo shooting. Elise Stefanik, QAnon queen rhetoric threatens U.S. security. Newsweek. You can go on and on and on. And if someone is really trying to pursue knowledge and understand the position of Stefanik, this is the first thing they're confronted with. And with Carlson, it's similar. So we have to define a few things here, my friends. First of all, what is the Great Replacement Theory? Now, I'm going to do a longer episode about this later, but it's good for us to understand something. The Great Replacement Theory is simply the idea that by 2050 or so, in, the, that, in that ballpark, whites are going to be a minority um, due to the increasing rates of minority populations um, reproducing and coming in certain countries. And this is intentional. This is being forced upon white majority countries by this cabal of elites that want to see the white race destroyed. That's the Great Replacement Theory in a nutshell. The argument Carlson and Stefanik are making are not the Great Replacement Theory. They're simply saying that if you let a certain demographic into the country uh, it, without the, going through the proper processes, it is possible that that can be used for political leverage. Now, conservative pundits have been going out there and they've been quoting old books that Democratic strategists writ wrote about uh, about uh, demographics. They've been quoting the Centers for American Project uh, Pro Progress who have used the same exact idea, by the way, to want to increase the victories of the Democratic Party. I'm not interested in doing that. What I'm particularly interested in doing is showing what this use of the Great Replacement Theory to, des to, to describe traditional mainstream views about immigration is philosophically. Now, I'll say this much. I don't entirely endorse the views of the Republican Party on this issue entirely. I do believe that we need a, we have a secure border. I do believe that the rule of law is important, um, but I also believe that the, the immigration system is fundamentally broken and that the visa system is fundamentally broken and people shouldn't have to play a lottery to get into a country that guarantees the natural right of freedom to all of its citizens by preserving it. I think there's a lot of different aspects of the immigration issue that I will not get into today, but I don't entirely agree with all of it. But I am, I, I am a student enough, and all of you are a student enough to know that this has nothing to do with racism. Now, the use of the Great Replacement Theory to describe this political, uh, these political beliefs is not simply a smear. Many people will say, well, it's a smear. Yes, I get it, but guess what? It's something else something more sinister that you may even use in your own political conversation. It's called proximity ethics. So what do I mean? I've, I've coined this term. Proximity ethics is when you try to say something is good or bad, a value judgment in other words, off the basis of what is what it is close to. I always use the analogy of the uh, diesel or the gasoline wielding man. Let's say there's a fire happening next to someone and he's wielding a can of gasoline and there's someone that walks up to him and says, hey, you have that gasoline therefore you started the fire. Whereas the other possibilities could have been that that person was just filling up his car with that tank of gasoline. Now, the problem is there's an immediate association with the prowess and the capabilities of gasoline, i.e. to produce fires and what is happening. And that association takes place of any further inquiry. Here's the, how the same thing is happening with the Great Replacement Theory. There's an association with talk over demographics, which both the theory has and 
than the sentiments over demographic change in the electorate have, and therefore they are seen as one and the same. But this is missing, not even missing the forest for the trees, this is missing the entire forest entirely and looking at an entirely different forest and assuming the forest because they have the same leaves are the same. No, every claim has its own epistemic uniqueness, even if it's a particularly dull claim, even if it's a particularly unoriginal and trite claim, every claim has its own epistemic uniqueness and it is incumbent upon us as thinking individuals, as wielders of reason, to look at a claim on its merits or lack thereof and then render judgment upon the rigorous processes of engaging with that claim. But what the media is doing, they are essentially sitting down and saying, okay, this, this theory right here talks about demographics and this other claim here is about demographics. Therefore, they're one and the same and we have to make a value judgment based on that. When the Albany Times Union says, well, she's not using the exact language, but she's using the principles, they never define what principles. The principles of that theory are built upon the idea of democide and a conspiracy against whites. The principles of a theory of letting the rule of law be preserved and not allowing immigration to be used as a tool to influence political uh, uh, outcomes is has nothing to do with race and everything to do with value systems, structure, and process. That's the problem. But when you look at the surface, and I need you all to, I'm serious, I need all of you to do some reflection. Because I have, this, I have done this before. I'm sure some of you have done this before. There have been some times where I have read a headline and I have seen an idea, so seen an idea out there in the, in, in the world. And I have thought to myself, I had a visceral knee jerk reaction. And then immediately I form a conclusion. That doesn't help you grow, and that weakens your understanding of the world, my friends. Proximity ethics is even more devious than that. Because whereas I made a private conclusion in my mind, if I were to then use that thought to make a conclusion about how things should work generally, what is right and wrong in general, oh my gosh, I'm binding people to false ideas. The problem is, my friends, we don't live in the world of the literary mind, and we need to get back to a world of the literary mind. This is not about great replacement. This is not about dem demographics fundamentally. Fundamentally, this is about how we use language to form conclusions. This is about how we use ethics and eth ethical understanding to interact with certain concepts. This is how we use our reason, our God-given innate reason to understand certain things. I'm not here to provide apologia for conservatism or for whatever. You know, I am not here to provide, provide apologia for my own ideology. I am here to get all of you to think and see past this fog. Don't let headlines dictate your understanding. Don't let headlines or shallow associations uh, defer you and, de and, and detour you from being able to go in and look at something. Because guess what? When you understand the foundations of an idea, no one can fool you. Do not trust everything you see. But that doesn't mean trust anything. Uh, don't trust anything. It's important to trust some things. But if you see something, approach it with a nat natural curiosity. If that curiosity turns into a skepticism, fine. If not, fine. And just deal with things as if you were a so uh, sojourner in this intellectual journey in life. Deal with things that way. Don't deal with things the way the media is dealing with them right now as it relates to this theory. Think on it, my friends. I love you guys so much. If you love me, please support me. Patreon.com slash Watson. Go to my Discord, which is in the comment section down below. My local, switch my local.com, my PayPal, official cwatsonjimbo.com. Uh, please be sure to like this video, to comment on this video, to subscribe to this channel, and to share this video. This message is dynamite, my friends. I love you all, and please stay pensive. Bye, guys.